yesterday um, they decided not to cast their vote. And so I plan on asking them why they cast their vote. You know, what, what made them think that, you know, this was not an important vote? Because certainly to us, it was extremely important. Oh, and, and there, there was a phone call uh, on the bus. Remember, uh, Congressman Ted Deutsch, talk to me a little bit about that, uh, where he was offering support for you guys. Yeah, Congressman Ted Deutsch, throughout all of this, has offered his, you know, support. And I think it's uh, really important that one of our Congress people actually has our back throughout this entire experience. Um, it's really great to know that we can contact his office at any time if there's anything that we do need up here, um, any information that we need or need to speak to anybody about that. It's really, it's really, I like it a lot. Thank you so much, Dimitri. I'll let Thank you put you. your stuff on the bus right now. Uh, Chris, again, we're going to walk with these students to the state capitol uh, before these meetings begin. They have a long, full agenda. All right, Diane, thank you very much. Let us know uh, what develops along the way. Joining us now is CNN political analyst David Gregory and reporter and editor-at-large for CNN Politics, Chris Saliza. So, David, we're certainly featuring these kids because they're a different aspect of these tragedies than we've seen before. Victims uh, that are young enough to have a real uh, reservoir of sympathy for what they live through and old enough to speak their own mind. But they're not alone. Uh, at all. You got 97% of Americans polled say that they want something to change with background checks. I think you got to be careful about the general and the specific. 97 is the general. That's huge. Background checks is the specific goal. So the question is, do you believe this could be a tipping point? Well, I think something is different in the ways that we've been talking about. Young people, high school students who have literally faced this horror face to face. They're also of a generation where they have grown up since the time that they were in preschool, actually, where they have had to do active shooter drills at their schools. All of us as parents of, of young enough kids to have had to explain what that is and why that's necessary know that that's a horrible thing to have to force them to face that reality. So there's a a new generation of activism that has to only begin here. I mean, that student was talking about getting up to speed on gun laws and being able to debate lawmakers. It's more than that. As we've been saying, it's about activism in terms of registering voters, about channeling the energy to vote on this issue, uh, whether it's in state government or in primaries uh, for congressional races, potential level. So, there Crystal is, is a... Go ahead. Oh, oh, so sorry. I just wanted to... We're watching them as they are getting organized, all now gathering together. But, Crystal, is a, I just want to... I mean... ...political type, and I That's want... That's fair. Yeah, I want the your cold-blooded reality check. When a hundred teenagers show up at the State House with all of the zeal and the passion that these kids have, having lived through this tragedy, do lawmakers sit up and take notice, or is, do they just pay them lip service because, guess what, you're not voters yet? Um, I, I think, look, uh, politicians pay attention to anyone who is passionate, right, because passion equals your chances of voting going up. Uh, mm -hmm. And they are ultimately mm -hmm. in the customer service business. I mean, uh, you know, if you were standing for re-election every two years, you would listen to what uh, your constituents would say. What I think we have to be careful of is this is 100 kids. Um, they have done a remarkable job, I think, of uh, drawing attention to this, uh, speaking out, uh, organizing. Uh, in ways we haven't seen in the past. And I think nothing changes until everything changes, right? I mean, it, it, I can give you, I can cite you uh, chapter and verse of ways in which these sh shootings play out in the past in which the momentum peters out. Um, and maybe that'll happen here too, but maybe it won't. I mean, I think you always have to hold open the possibility that change is possible as it relates to this. I think what is hard, David touched on this, it's the, in my opinion, politically, the most important thing. People who support gun rights have a very dedicated history of voting on that issue. It's not everybody, but it's enough. People who want more, uh, uh, what they would call common sense gun control measures, there is a sliver of people who vote on that issue alone. It is not enough for lawmakers to feel as though they will pay political pain and price for doing something like you saw in the Florida legislature yesterday, which is not being willing to debate the idea of an assault weapons ban, which candidly I, I, I can't even imagine passing in that chamber, but even debating it, because they're not afraid. There's no consequence 
on that side. There is a consequence on the pro-gun rights side, and that to me is the inequality that you see politically, which makes this harder. And, and yet, it's not. Go ahead, David. Give us a quick point that I want to get back to the kids. This is not uh, just about presidential leadership. We've seen presidential leadership before on this issue. It mm -hmm. can help. And maybe under President Trump, he'll get something done on background checks, on access to guns if you're under 21. But that's not the only factor here. Mm. And also, look, that's the point. What you say to a pollster is one thing. What you do at the polls yep. is another. Gentlemen, we'll check back with you in a little bit. Now, tonight, uh, to seize the momentum here, CNN is going to have a live town hall. You'll see students from Stoneman Douglas High School. You'll see lawmakers who are relevant in Florida. And they will discuss this demand for gun violence reform. What will it be like? We got Kaylee Harding live in Sunrise, Florida with a preview. Well, Chris, that passion, zeal, and outrage that we've seen from so many of the students, the survivors of Stoneman Douglas over the past week is coming here to the BB&T Center tonight. This arena, just 15 miles from the high school, will be the forum for this town hall discussion, a chance for the students of Stoneman Douglas, their parents, teachers, and administrators to ask questions of elected officials and even a spokesperson from the NRA. More than 5,000 people are expected to attend. Among those on stage, though, Congressman Ted Deutsch, a Democratic representative for this district, as we've heard this morning, and as many students have told me, he's been a tremendous resource for many of the students over this past week. Also, Florida's two senators, Democrat Bill Nelson and Republican Marco Rubio, a guy who the spotlight is on. These teenagers have not been shy about calling him out for the millions of dollars that he's accepted from the NRA, and I wouldn't anticipate that they hold back on him tonight. Also, as I mentioned, a national spokesperson from the NRA will be present as well. We should mention President Trump and Florida Governor Rick Scott were both invited but declined to attend the event or appear via satellite. This event tonight we anticipate being emotional and powerful. Absolutely, Kaylee. That will be fascinating to watch this discussion with all of these different constituencies in one room. Thank you very much. So, in just moments, these students that you see on the right side of your screen, they will begin their march to Florida's state capitol to bring their message. All right. Also, Chief of Staff John Kelly and Jared Kushner are reportedly in a feud over top secret act. For the students, these students survived the Florida school massacre. They are getting set to march to the state capitol in Florida. They are calling on their state lawmakers and the governor to make changes to gun laws. And you can see our own Diane Gallagher. She is marching alongside the students. She joins us live. What's their message, Diane? You know, Allison, we literally about two minutes ago started walking toward this capital. I have senior Susanna Barna with me right now. And uh, Susanna, what's the message you guys are taking to the capital? Um, we're taking that this can that a tragedy like this can never happen again and that we will never let it happen again. So, well, yeah. What do you want from lawmakers? What do you want them to do to make it never happen again? Well, today we're really just hoping that they'll be receptive to what we're saying and listen to what we 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 went through and just be um, sensitive to that. And I mean, we obviously want them to listen to our ideas on policy. But for now, if we could just get them to actually care about the matters we're talking about, that's probably the first step. How did you feel yesterday when they voted not to even take up the discussion on that assault weapon uh, ban? I mean, it's a minor setback, but if this is going to be like a long term, a long term mission, which I really hope it is, that's just one thing. They're, they could always propose another bill. Similar to that, and I mean, we're, we're working on small steps first, and we'll see what happens. Thank you so much, Susanna. You know, Alice and Chris, most of these uh, students that I've talked to here have said that they understand nothing's going to happen overnight. They recognize that uh, this is not going to be something that they snap their fingers, they talk to these lawmakers, and suddenly everything changes. And they seem to recognize that this is a long-haul uh, affair, that they are hoping that many of them, especially those seniors and juniors, once they turn 18, uh, they register to vote, that they will use their power of voting uh, as well as their power of their voice so, again, marching to the Capitol, Chris Allison, I'm going to send it back to you. 
All right, Diane, thank you very much. All right, so we have some breaking news for you. This is uh, CNN Breaking News. Reverend Billy Graham. Uh, has died. Word is circulating right now. He was 99 years old, born in 1918. Of course, the name is a household name in America, one of our most famous ministers. In fact, uh, part of his congregation has been in Parkland, Florida, doing crisis management after the massacre there. He preached around the world, speaking to presidents and world leaders. He has literally been... Truman to Barack Obama. So joining us now, our reporter and editor at large for CNN Politics, Chris Eliza, and CNN political analyst David Gregory, who of course has written a book on faith. And it's hard to um, underscore enough just how influential uh, this man has been in our lives. Well, not just in, in politics and, of course, in faith and popularizing faith as a televangelist, uh, someone who did it, uh, especially after World War II in Los Angeles. He's a, he's a, a famous part of the Louis Zamperini story of Un Unbroken, who uh, went to a Billy Graham revival and his life was changed and became a born-again Christian and stopped uh, drinking. And so it was Billy Graham uh, who was really one of the forerunners of uh, the televangelist movement. Uh, his parents were raised as uh, Calvinist Protestants. He joined the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, and so he, he popularized uh, faith uh, and the evangelical movement uh, like no one else had, at the same time had this incredible political resonance, some of which was controversial. He was close friends with Richard Nixon and had a blind on matters of war and peace and more up to date and for a president that I covered George W Bush he even at, at an advanced age was incredibly influential in the lives of our leaders it was in conversation with Billy Graham that uh, President Bush said that he uh, found a, a renewed relationship with God became a born-again Christian uh, himself and set himself on a course uh, that was so important in his own life so uh, this is just a, a tremendous loss uh, in the world of faith, in our national life, uh, in our political life. Uh, uh, Billy Graham was, uh, was a titan of this country. The, uh, Chris, the Time magazine once referred to Billy Graham as the Pope of the Protestant movement. And for a long time, he was the cohesive point for the evangelical movement in this country. Yep. He was someone who uh, favored non-denominational Christianity, which was a very new idea in the 50s and 60s. People really stuck to their churches. Obviously, his parents were Calvinist. He had started uh, with the Baptist church, but he started to engender this idea that it's not about the organization, it's about the faith and how it is lived as a mission. That's right, uh, and I would say, I, I think, uh, David touched on this, but I think the influence of Billy Graham on mainstreaming, mainstreaming, excuse me, Political force has faded somewhat. The, the the election of Donald Trump, I think, is in some ways uh, a coda uh, to that, a bookmark. But but in the 1980s, the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, uh, Billy Graham's influence and the evangelical movement's influence on particularly in social uh, politics, I in the conservative movement, vast. I, I mean, literally almost impossible to overstate the ways in which he tra he helped transform what sort of conservatism, what republicanism, particularly on the social side, uh, meant and what kind of voters made up the Republican uh, coalition for those years. I, I do think we are... Uh, I don't know if it's a, a, a one-time change tied to Donald Trump or a broader change, but we're in, we're in a change period from that. But for two-plus decades, that was the dominant uh, or one of the dominant voices within the conservative movement. Yeah, and I mean, I think that what you're touching on and what David can build on is that he believed in sort of the big tent philosophy. He insisted, even in the 50s, that his revival... meetings be uh, integrated racially and I was interested to read that he bailed out Martin Luther King Jr. from jail
provide that modern evangelical movement which went beyond the, the established dominations uh, was then, continues to be controversial, but also incredibly popular because of how accessible Billy Graham was. And then modern day uh, evangelists like a Joel Osteen are incredible in their reach around the world and in how I've been to Joel Osteen's services, how incredibly diverse and huge his, uh, his Sunday morning services are. And, and Billy Graham was really the, the forerunner of that. Um, making it more acceptable, breaking down a, a lot of barriers, which also engendered criticism within evangelical circles uh, and certainly does in, in among modern uh, evangelicals. There, there are a lot of interdenominational fights, but Billy Graham was really one of the first to break through all of that to reach a, a broader audience and then to add what Chris was referring to, this incredible uh, political influence as kind of America's preacher, certainly the preacher to the most powerful figures in the country. And what a run he had also. I mean, to die 99 years of age, he fought like crazy. I think it was in the 90s that he was first diagnosed. that he was first diagnosed family. Of course, we're also following the survivors of the Florida massacre. They have begun their march to the Florida state capitol to bring their message directly to lawmakers. We'll have we have some breaking news for you. These are live pictures. These are the students who survived the Florida school massacre. They have arrived on the steps of the state capitol. And as you can see, they are beginning to go in, get checked in, obviously through security. CNN's Diane Gallagher is with them. Diane, how was the march? Yeah, Allison, really short march. Just. Talk to me about why you felt you needed to come up here today. Well, I mean, I'm their, their teacher. You know, I came up with another colleague, and the, and the two of us were senior teachers exclusively, and I've, you know, had all these kids in class, so all, all, the, all the famous kids now, David and Emma, and, you know, you're obviously compelled, and, you know, it, was, it affected us as well as it affected them. I probably, you know, I luckily got out that I'm here, so as long with, with, the, with the kids as well. But, yeah, I just, you know, I, I drove them up. Well, actually, it's for you guys. I mean, we're, we're going back tonight to the debate, and... I volunteered to be the guy who would drive up a few of them and then leave today at noon so we could get back in time for the town hall tonight. So, As a government teacher, uh, how do you feel about watching them sort of use that, that voice that they have to come up here? It's, it's amazing. I mean, it's, I just hope that it endures. I hope they continue to, you know, I'm, I'm just, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. I'm kind of lost for words. But, you know, they're, they're all bright, as we've seen. They're, they're all, they're passionate. I mean, they were working seven hour right up yesterday they were on their computers they were you know the donations came in from the Clooney's and from oprah and they were trying to figure out you know who was going to control the money where it was going to go and they were concerned about it immediately so these kids are on are on point with this and it's just a matter of trying to decide you know you know they're, they're going to sustain it we're going to washington in march and i mean i just you know i hope something gets done it was kind of deflating yesterday when we found out about the, the votes you know right when we got out of the car i mean we, that was the first thing we heard about and i don't want to talk about the other nonsense they voted on yesterday that your students are doing that. I mean, it's, it's hard. I've been there 20 years. I have children. You know, yesterday was one of my students. She's a wonderful girl. I'm a father of two daughters. And, you know, you want to try to stay strong in, in, in front of the kids. Um, so it's, it's you know, again, that's what we're there for. I mean, me and my colleague who came up with me, we're just, you know, we're trying to stay in the background. We haven't really been on TV that much. We're not trying to be on TV. We just, you know, we, whatever they need, we're here, here for them. Thank you so much. Chris Allison. And thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, let's get some good perspective, someone who understands the politics down there and some kind of sense of what will happen or not. Miami Beach Mayor Philip Levine, he's a Democratic candidate for Florida governor. We know you have an ad out about this situation, uh, Mr. Mayor. It's important. Give me your read on what the likelihood of change is at the state level in Florida. 